Hey friends, welcome back to another episode of Going Nuclear. I'm here with a really special guest today. His name is Isuru Senevi Ratna, who is a finance professional in the nuclear energy industry. He's also very involved with the nuclear community here in New York City, where we're filming right now. Uh, so Isuru, welcome. Tell me about your journey into the industry. Tell me a bit about your passions around finance in the nuclear energy industry. That's that's a topic, a very hot topic that a lot of folks don't know about. So I'd love to deep dive into that topic with you. Yeah, so my, my background is in, uh, in energy investment. So I've been doing that for almost two decades now. So I've uh, spent a lot of time in Canada um, looking at oil and gas. Uh, and then um, when I set up my own firm in 2015, I started looking at um, climate solutions uh, that also enable energy pro uh, prosperity. So um, I've been uh, investing in energy storage, uh, hydrogen fuel cells, uh, and got into uranium. Uh, and that led me to uh, looking at the nuclear space. Folks with backgrounds in nuclear engineering, they're really focused towards the reactor technologies, right? They're, they're focused on how many megawatts are going to the grid. Um, but I think with finance, there's such a large element in the whole life cycle of nuclear, right? So when it comes to uranium being dug out of the ground, all the way to decommissioning these these power plants, tell me about your thoughts on uh, finance professionals, um, what areas of the industry they contribute towards, and why nuclear finance is so important. Yeah, nuclear is a, a kind of a, off the energy technologies out there that we are thinking about for decarbonization. Nuclear, I guess similar to hydro, is a very capital intensive business where initially you have to spend a lot of money to get the asset up and running. But then uh, once you do that, then it's a very low cost on a go forward basis, thanks to the efficiency of uh, folk like you uh, who make uh, the nuclear operations uh, happen. A large amount of energy produced with a very small amount of people and resources and so on. Um, if you think about the life cycle, you know, uh, cost of energy, uh, unit of energy coming from a nuclear uh, reactor, the uh, fuel cost is something like 8%. And of that fuel, uh, the uranium portion is about a third of that. So it's a, the fuel portion is very small, but the capital portion for the, the building the facility is very high. So the financing of these kind of large infrastructure projects and how to make that happen is a big um, issue that we are um, looking to solve with uh, kind of novel concepts like uh, green bonds and so on. Tell me a bit about these, these green bonds, right? Um, I know in the past in many countries, uh, you know, including Canada, a lot of the clean energy credits or green bonds uh, are haven't haven't really been used toward nuclear, even though it's low carbon um, uh, and gr zero greenhouse gas emissions uh, source of electricity. Uh, has there been movements in that space in countries across the world? And tell us tell us a little bit about the implications there for um, new nuclear investments. I think there is a growing recognition that we can't. Uh, get to net zero without firm clean generation. And the firm clean generation can be nuclear, it can be um, gas with carbon capture, or it can be renewables with the energy storage. Um, if you think about the first of a kind deployment of any of these technologies that I talked about, uh, they are or or originally initially very expensive, but the hope is that as you deploy more of these technologies, uh, the cost of it will come down. Um, and yeah, there's a, you know, so with that growing recognition of the need for firm clean energy and the need for nuclear, um, for the most, you know, for the most part in the US, we have uh, had these um, in, uh, investment tax credits and production tax credits that were only um, available to solar and wind technologies but the Inflation Reduction Act opened that up to nuclear as well. So it doesn't matter if you are producing a clean energy unit uh, from a solar, wind, or nuclear, you still get the same um, choice, whether you can do an investment tax credit or a production tax credit. So in an investment tax credit uh, scenario for nuclear, uh, 
the initial um, federal government uh, support for that is about 30 percent of the investment will be covered by the federal government. But then you have these adders if you're um, going into an energy community where you're, uh, you're displacing a coal asset or if you have these um, domestic consumption uh, requirements and other kind of things that help the community uh, aspect of it, you can get up to 50% of the investment um, support from the federal government. So that's a huge um, incentive to uh, help. And states have been leading on this too. So New York actually was the first state in the U.S. to give zero emission credits for nuclear generation. Uh, and that helped when, when gas price was very low and electricity price was very, was very low across the country. Uh, the zero emission credits helped the upstate nuclear plants in New York um, weather that uh, storm. But back to your question of uh, financing. So in the in the UK, uh, they set nuclear assets up in this uh, regulatory asset base. So you kind of and what they found basically what they found was that the interest cost on the debt to build a nuclear plant was a big portion of the um, actual cost of the electricity that's produced. I think it's something like a third. So. What they decided was, uh, as opposed to try to build these assets in the kind of uh, regular market, they set the nuclear asset aside as a regulatory asset base. Uh, and that means that you could start collecting money from consumers to help build the asset so that you don't have to take a huge amount of debt to do that. And in places like, um, you know, places like uh, Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in uh, Egypt, um, other countries, not the U.S., have been helping uh, these uh, emerging countries with financing of their nuclear assets. Uh, so China and Russia have been at the forefront of this, um, but that's uh, maybe changing. So we just saw an announcement this week where the uh, Canadian Export-Import Bank is uh, setting aside $3 billion to help build a CANDU reactor or two CANDU reactors in um, Romania. So I, I think what, the, what these governments are realizing is that when you um, have this partnership uh, to b help build a nuclear plant, that's a 50 to 100 year kind of relationship that you have with that country and that you can help um, kind of ensure um, non-proliferation but also um, uh, have a kind of say in the um, uh, energy policy, like choices that the country is doing, you kind of be a partner with that uh, country going forward, as opposed to leave that kind of geostrategic influence to uh, a competitor. Yeah, you, I, I like the example of the, the, that you brought up, the Canadian example, and that's, that's fresh off the press, right? That, uh, that the $3 billion that's being provided um, to to Romania, right? Uh, tell me tell me about uh, different structures um, that have been used by different utilities, right? Because I know I know there's Rosatom, there's there's Kepco, there's now now Canada is also back in back in the game with the two new reactors in Romania. Um, there's there are some funding uh, streams where uh, where parts of the profits go toward paying back the investment. Right, and then and then there's also um, you know I've seen I've seen uh, investment strategies where the company the utilities like hey listen we we own like 20 percent of the asset right or a certain percent of the asset and tell me about um, the most effective strategy out there for uh, for international countries that can't necessarily ha afford a, a nuclear power plant up front but have the option of working together with um, uh, with another organization from internationally. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's what you're seeing in so you know, I'd say uh, Bangladesh as an example, where the um, Russian government uh, through Rosatom, I believe, is giving um, very long repayment uh, timeframes for the initial capital, uh, and you know there's. Um, 
kind of uh, there's Russian schools uh, near the nuclear power plant and there's technical skills and so on. There's uh, Bangladeshis that are flying to um, uh, Russia to visit those sites, learn the skills, etc. And that's a you know very long-term kind of strategic influence, right? As far as the kind of if you think about the U.S. market, the players, and maybe Ontario is also another thing up. So Ontario is leading the world in building nuclear, maybe at this point. Uh, not only uh, is Ontario kind of refurbishing all its um, can-do fleets, the large nuclear plants, it's also building North America's first uh, small modular reactor using uh, G Hitachi uh, BWX300. Um, yeah, I'd say uh, if you think about the entity, and, and in the U.S., the entities uh, outside of uh, federally uh, driven demonstration projects, which is currently happening in Texas and uh, Wyoming, uh, one of the areas, uh, one of the entities that is looking to build nuclear is the Tennessee Valley Authority. So if you think about the commonality between, say, Ontario Power, power Generation and Tennessee Valley Authority, uh, they are both uh, public-owned, um, you know, single investor uh, kind of entities. And the other thing is, um, these are, uh, they are in a market where they are the sole provider of electricity as a service. The, the entire, you know, whether when you switch the light switch on, the electricity comes on thanks to Ontario Power Generation or thanks to Tennessee Valley Authority. In, in New York State, for instance, there is no one uh, person, one entity that's responsible. There's, you know, multiple um, uh, entities that are providing various portions of that service, but not one, you know, who's responsible for all of that. And I'm not sure, you know, this is beyond my pay grade to figure out what, uh, whether the, the, those, in those models, um, you know, the pros and cons, uh, the whole of that. But at, at least if you think about the people who are building nuclear in the U.S. and in Canada, it's people who are taking responsibility for uh, soup to nuts, uh, the whole electricity as a service provision. When in uh, kind of marketized or uh, commoditized um, environments like the ISOs and the RTOs in the US, there is no one person who's responsible to keep the lights on. And what that means is um, everybody is doing these different things to make profit, and that's fine. I'm not against profit, but uh, there has to be somebody who is the kind of backstop when the sun doesn't shine or the wind doesn't blow or the gas lines are frozen or whatever. This is what just happened in Texas. Uh, uh, not frozen, but uh, so Texas just had a emergency alert where for the first time since uh, the storm, winter storm Uri, they announced a um, emergency when solar, wind and gas could not perform uh, as predicted, and that meant that they had to curtail demand uh, from mostly from industrial customers to keep the grid stable. Um, and I think that's a dangerous precedent to set. Uh, while maybe industrial customers can do that for a day or two, but if you are trying to do that kind of every time the, uh, the system doesn't function, it just becomes an unattractive location for you to have your industrial capacity. And that's what we're seeing in Germany, where industry is leaving Germany in droves. Uh, so the industrial base, I mean, Germany is such a kind of uh, industrial powerhouse of the world uh, since you know, unification. Uh, and that is at risk because of the energy supply is screwed. Uh, and I don't want that to happen to Texas. I don't want that to happen to New York. Uh, we need this kind of uh, financial structure, so the reward structures that reward not just the provision of a unit of electricity, but the ability to provide that unit of electricity. So capacity payments or um, payments for grid stability services, none of these is currently valued in the market system that we have set up in New York, for instance, or in Texas, for instance.
So I am fine with the market-based system as long as the market-based system performs uh, the services that it's required. It is not doing that in Germany and it might be uh, at risk in Texas. Those are some really good examples that you bring up. And uh, just uh, historically, you know, I'm, I'm going to reference Meredith Anglin's book, uh, Shorting the Grid, uh, which does a really good job in going through exactly this topic, right? Like the history of the RTOs, the regional trans transmission organizations, and how they were once vertically integrated, right? How like the utility, so the folks producing power, the grid, um, and then the, the, the grid infrastructure, like that was all integrated into one, right? And now when you, when you see how, you know, RTOs, uh, regional transmission organizations, uh, the, the grid, the utility, they're all operating kind of separately in the United States, uh, and even the the incentives that are provided to um, uh, to the different utilities, it's leading to a kind of uh, destruction of grid stability, right? And we're seeing that with Texas as an example. I know in California, that's a really good example of things that are not just going well, right? So. Do you think the solution is for us to go back to how it was before? Vertically integrated utilities, incentivize power output, incentivize um, um, creating more generating capacity. What are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, that's a tough question. And uh, I, yeah, I, I do recommend Meredith Anguin's book, uh, Shorting the Grid. And she talks about the fragilization of the electric grid, which is what we just talked about. Um, and another uh, piece that I'd highly recommend is Emmett Penny. Uh, he's a great uh, writer, um, and he just had a piece a couple of months ago. I believe the name is um, Enron After All. Uh, and he talks about how these vested interests like Enron are gamifying the um, the market-based uh, electricity provision systems to, you know, enrich themselves at the expense of the grandma who's gonna get her power cut off. Um, yeah, I mean, I I think both models could work. Uh, the market-based model could work. Uh, I think market-based systems can work if the right price signals are uh, provided. So one of the efforts that I am uh, doing is to try to get an uh, economy-wide price on carbon such that all the proceeds are returned to households. Uh, what that does is it doesn't try to incentivize any one technology or the other. It just says uh, there's an externality to society that uh, c carbon creates. So you kind of ding people, ding businesses as they bring carbon into the system. Mm -hmm. But carbon pricing is carbon taxes are very uh, regressive. So what you need to do is to make it not regressive is to return all fee proceeds to households such that those who consume less carbon or the, those produce less carbon into the atmosphere uh, versus those who uh, consume more carbon based products, um, they actually get more in a dividend than they pay in the elevated cost of goods and services. So it's a, it's a very um, progressive way to actually fix the carbon pr uh, problem. Uh, and it's not like I'm just, you know, dinging somebody who has a higher income. It's just any billionaire who has, um, you know, carbon-free lifestyle. Uh, maybe they have a nuclear micro-reactor in their basement uh, that charges their jet and uh, their jacuzzi. Um, they wouldn't. They would actually get a, a, a dividend check in their mail that is higher than the elevated cost of goods and services that now include the price, price of carbon. So this is like a rebate. It's like a rebate that you're talking about. Uh, it's a it's a dividend. Uh, it's rebate sounds like it's um, related to something you do. A dividend is a universal dividend. So you, as being a household, as being a citizen, you get a, a kind of a incentive. S incentive also sounds like it's related to something you do. The the, the dividend is universal. So like if you are 
a registered household um, and you have this many children and that means per adult, per a child, you get a certain amount of money that doesn't get funneled through the government. So like if you put a price on carbon, you can solve the carbon problem if the price is high enough. Mm -hmm. But then I don't think the government, I don't know if the government is the right actor to distribute all that money. Mm -hmm. They could decide to build um, things that maybe society doesn't want or doesn't need. If, if you return all the money to households, you solve not only the carbon um, the carbon problem, the climate problem, but also do it in a way that um, elevates all solutions. Mm -hmm. So that you don't have to pick, you know, uh, this government likes nuclear, but the next government likes solar. So you don't have to have these like discontinuous uh, programs. And when you fix the incentive structure in place, you can raise the carbon price high enough to matter. Mm. Because all the carbon pricing schemes that are in place today, except for like maybe a couple in like Sweden, um, are too low to matter. They're just there, everybody's kind of doing these uh, token efforts uh, and they don't actually get us to where we need because emissions keep going up uh, year after year. Anyway, so that's just a one way to solve the market-based problem. You can incorporate uh, the attributes that matter beyond the provision of that electron. So um, grid inertia or, um, uh, or the, ability, the black start ability. So if there are a outage, that means you can start the whole grid based on this one thing. Mm -hmm. So these are all attributes that are currently completely unpriced into these markets. So as Anguin pointed out in her book, Selling electricity is not a very valuable, uh, it's, not, it's not valued in the way, same way as you know, building renewable assets. So building renewable assets is rewarded because it's out of market payments for subsidies, etc. And you know, they are not making money on selling those electrons. They are bidding zero into the, into the um, queue. So anyway, we are getting into the weeds, but my point is, uh, however, so you could have a kind of top-down uh, control system like TVA or OPG, and that could work, or you could have a market-based system that could work, but as of now, the market-based systems that are out there are not serving the purpose of either decarbonization or uh, grid stability. Mm and or national security, which is another issue that we haven't gotten into. Yeah, yeah, like, I wonder, I wonder how uh, other countries in the world, like, if you look at China, right, their, you know, their government, uh, obviously, it, you know, I'm not going to go into the politics of things, but if you look at their government, like, their, the, the, the policy makers are mostly engineers, right? And like, professionals who understand the grid, they understand how, you know, electrons go into the system, and I think, I think because of that, uh, you're you're seeing that this country is, you know, decarbonizing their grid, right? They're producing lots of nuclear power plants um, uh, to replace their coal power plants, and um, and I wish we had that same push here in the West as well, where um, we incentivize a stronger grid, stronger economy, more manufacturing, more you know GDP goes up, right? So these things are all like interconnected. Are are we kind of having a wake-up call now in the United States and in, you know, that, you know, we're seeing these huge uh, areas of industrialization of, you know, like California and in Texas especially, and we're, we're seeing our economy as a threat, be, uh, threatened because our grid is not stabilized, because our, our generating assets aren't doing us, uh, you know, doing us much benefit. Uh, is there a wake-up call in terms of the government? And, and do you think it's, uh, it is a bit of a lag response, but do you think we can, we can change our policies fast enough to make a difference? Yes, I think there's two things that have happened. Actually, both of them are the one, I guess. Um, so I'd point to California having a huge wake-up call where the present governor was 
gunning to shut down Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant. And, and, and then last year he turned around and said, no, we need to save this plant. This produces 8% of our entire electricity supply. If we shut this down, we are going to have rolling blackouts. And this is what the scientists and the engineers have been saying all along. But um, when push comes to shove, it was abundantly clear that this is going to cause mass um, suffering. Mm. Uh, and that's not something that any governor wants to happen on their watch. right? So uh, I commend uh, the Governor Newsom for um, changing his tune on that and uh, stepping up to um, in a very anti-nuclear state to step up and say, no, this is something we need and we need to make sure we provide the right incentives or the right signals to make sure it keeps running. So that's a huge, uh, that's a huge plus in the US and that's very new. And the other thing that happened in the last couple of years is the uh, war in Ukraine. Um, the whole world was pursuing the German model of decarbonization or German model of what they thought was decarbonization which is to shut down nuclear or ignore nuclear and build solar and wind and storage. And that's great, build solar, wind and storage. And that's, but the um, German model of decarbonization, first of all, only gets you so far. So after spending half a trillion euros on this energy vendor, energy transition plan that Germany had, the biggest source of Germany's electricity was still coal. Their carbon footprint is multiples higher than their neighbor France, which is 70% nuclear and 15% renewables. So, uh, so I, I think if you look at all the textbooks, they all had Germany, uh, the German model as the means to decarbonize uh, from my country, Sri Lanka to uh, other, you know, South Africa. Germany was inserting itself into other people's energy policies, saying, you got to do this, otherwise we won't give you funding. Mm. Uh, that's happening still today. But I think the world has realized uh, what the uh, kind of war in Ukraine showed is that Germany's model of decarbonization has left, has left this huge hole that they still needed to, they were still stuck with the uh, Russian gas. Uh, as the backstop for when the solar and wind um, kind of die down. Uh, and so uh, other countries were also going to this LNG plus solar plus wind kind of route. Uh, but maybe we should open our eyes and kind of expand our option set so that we can build a grid that's actually serving the purpose. So there, if, you, if you want to build an electric grid, there's three kind of fundamental components and they are largely in competition with each other. This affordability, reliability, and sustainability. So if you, we've kind of pursued the sustainability angle, the carbon angle, and I am, you know, here because of climate, but uh, pursuing the sustainability of the climate angle with uh, without regard to the reliability component or the cost component is a deadly scenario. Um, so because of you know, Germany sucking up all the coal and all the gas this last winter, Germany and Europe, to kind of survive the energy crisis that they kind of, kind of built themselves into, um, that meant that people in Pakistan didn't have the money to buy the coal, to buy the gas that they needed to keep themselves warm. And that's a kind of a very unjust human tragedy uh, that would not have happened if uh, European leaders were more uh, foresightful in their thinking of energy issues. Yeah, it's a really, it's a really unique way of um, seeing things, right? Like I've never, I've never looked at it from that perspective where the drown downstream effects of developed nations can can have a real impact on the ground for developing nations, right? And um, and the decisions that the poor decisions that are made by uh, policymakers can have those long-term repercussions for both the country and other countries. Uh, so that's that's a really good example. And I think I think this dialogue is is super important because you know the technical piece on nuclear energy is really exciting, but 
Um, the finance piece is something that I think a lot of nuclear professionals aren't necessarily always exposed to, especially those that have nuclear engineering background like myself, right? So I think this was a really good discussion. Uh, I learned a lot. Um, are there any last thoughts that you'd like to share uh, with, with the audience? Yeah, I'd say um, keep doing what you're doing. And um, yeah, I'd say don't believe what I say. Uh, you know, read stuff and like, um, you know, Meredith Angwin or um, uh, The Bright Future, a book uh, by Joshua Goldstein. It's a phenomenal um, kind of uh, expose into um, how energy systems work and how you can actually decarbonize uh, without kind of uh, causing mass poverty or um, energy scarcity. So uh, I think it's a really exciting time where the kind of world is waking up to the need for nuclear uh, and we need to figure out the financing or the market dynamics that um, enable that kind of mass rollout that we think is needed along with solar and wind to decarbonize the world. Uh, thanks again. This was a great discussion. And uh, I guess I'd love for you to chat a little bit about uh, New York City Climate Week Symposium uh, that you helped organize. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Tell us about uh, what the plan is for, for tomorrow and, uh, and what you're excited for. Sure, yeah. Um, Climate Week NYC happens uh, along with the UN General Assembly, which is happening in New York City right now. Uh, where the world's leaders are here and there's complete gridlock and you can't get anywhere. Um, and uh, so Climate Week has a 400 plus events all across the city. Uh, we are at one of them here. Um, so it's a, it's a really um, great place where lots of people are out there trying to learn about different solutions to our various problems. Um, and for the last two or three years, Nuclear New York has had the only kind of nuclear-related event at Climate Week. And so this year, uh, we are listed both on uh, Climate Week NY and uh, UNGA Science Summit. So this is uh, both for a domestic audience uh, and for an international audience, uh, where we have experts from around the world um, coming in and uh, talking about various aspects of uh, nuclear energy, and the kind of the climate angle, the um, the safety concerns, the um, uh, financing side of things, and uh, and the environmental case for nuclear, you know, space, land use, resource consumption, all that stuff. And so we are, um, we have um, probably 100 to 150 people show up in person, uh, and then we have maybe another 100 people online. And the event will be available online for stream uh, for uh, posterity on our website, uh, nuclearny.org. And uh, we are excited to kind of bring a lot more people who are maybe not uh, as up to speed on how critical this technology is and how um, it can enable both um, you know, the billions of people out there to have a quality of life that we enjoy uh, in the West while ensuring a livable planet for our children and our grandchildren and so on. So it's, it's going to be very good, and we are glad to have you here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so if you guys are interested, please check out the description. In the, uh, description. If you guys are interested in coming out or live, live streaming in, uh, check out the, the link in the description below. Uh, see you guys there. Thanks, Izuru. Thank you.